So it's just some of the things that he used. Now, again, obviously you can't do this with every single symbol, but it will help you to isolate some of the sounds, but it won't help you to basically decipher an entire wall of hieroglyphics. So that basically gives you like a little insight into what, what um, Champollion is talking about and that it can't all possibly be true. You can't decipher all of those um, Egyptian texts using these methods or just simply going back to Coptic. There has to be another way that you use, another thing that you use to help you decipher all of these Egyptian hieroglyphics. I mean, even going back to the hieratic and cursive hieroglyphics into the New Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, Old Kingdom, where they use different styles. And then you have to still differentiate from when the Romans was writing hieroglyphics and when the Greeks was writing hieroglyphics, in which case we see that if they didn't want to put Ramses' whole name up there, you know, you see how they did it with the the sun and, you know, the way I showed you. And in these cases, a lot of times, uh, what we call like abbreviations, a lot of the times the abbreviations was done by the uh, Greeks and the Romans. And it just took people a long time to figure out that this was the Romans and Greeks writing in hieroglyphics and that they just abbreviated. So, you know, with Champollion, you can't really go by everything he's talking about. What he really did was basically, you know, kick in the door and leave it open for a lot of people to come in and correct some of his mistakes and basically help to really decipher the uh, hieroglyphics. The problem is a lot of these people who came along later and was doing work, they are not recognized, they are not talked about. And then you have a lot of people like myself and many other scholars who basically did their own research because, listen, I'm gonna tell you, if, if you get into this stuff, if you're really into it, and you're really into hieroglyphics and deciphering it and looking into the language, when you look at the excuse they give us from Champollion, I don't think it's just that simple. It's like, you know, the stuff makes sense. The hieroglyphics, you see, well, wait a minute, what y'all are saying fits. I mean, we can basically read this stuff, but the way they're telling us how they did it, it, it don't work. It's, it don't fit. So they're leaving something out. And this is causing a huge problem for people who are now starting to come into this, this knowledge and start starting to do the research. And it will lead you to believe or not believe in Champollion, but it will lead you to not to basically question the whole process of reading, writing, and understanding uh, hieroglyphics. So now here's the thing that we are forgetting about. A lot of people forget that. Remember, we know that the uh, Greeks lived in Kemet. We know that they worked with the uh, Egyptians. We know that they lived with the Egyptians. And we have to uh, remember that, one, the Egyptians did not adopt anybody customs, any outside customs. And Herodotus attests to that fact that the Egyptians were learn any other languages or anything like that. So we can assume that the uh, the Greeks also knew Demotic, and this is how they uh, you know communicated with the Egyptians. They had to communicate some way, somehow, unless there was another language spoken that we don't know about, or uh, Demotic is um, just a lower form spoken only by just the commoners in uh, Kemet, uh, that could be possible as well. But we have to assume that the Greeks had to know this language and this was the way they was communicating. Now, again, Herodotus is the one who gave it the name Demotic. The Egyptians actually called the language uh, Shichat, which basically means writing for documents. So again, we're not going to know exactly how the language sounded, but it doesn't mean that the uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics or the Matanetra was not deciphered. The simple fact that the Egyptians had a name for it gives us a clue that, you know, this is a either a lower form of writing or a lower form of communication developed probably just to communicate, to do business or what have you. And there was another language that was spoken. But again, it doesn't mean that the hieroglyphics wasn't uh, figured out or that they didn't correspond the demotic to fit with the actual hieroglyphics in order for it to be uh, translated or deciphered. And it's, this is something we're going to get into as we uh, go along. So now, as I said in the beginning, I can understand why people are skeptical about the uh, the translation of the method nature. As I said, um, you know, when I first started studying this stuff, when I got into it, when I looked into the explanation for the decipherment of the Rosetta Stone and the Egyptian hieroglyphics. And I read about the whole story with Champollion, what I'm giving you right now. I said to myself, you know what, this is some bullshit. It's bullshit. 
because it just didn't fit. It didn't seem right, especially when you start getting into the Coptic part, because Coptic would not decipher the entire uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, as I'm explaining here. And they're not really going to give you too much more information into what El Champollion used. So, of course, you know, it's, it's really suspect, it's skeptical. And we know that, you know, these people lie. This is what they are doing. This is why a lot of people in the Kemetic community don't want to really deal with uh, European writings and stuff like that because we know they lie and they're damn sure not going to tell us the truth about something, especially if that truth is going to reveal uh, African people to look smarter than what they have portrayed us. And this is basically the case in this whole thing with Champollion as we're going to get into. But when you look at history, you still have to say to yourself, when you look at the history between the Greeks and the Egyptians, you have to say to yourself, of course, the Metoneta was deciphered. Of course, the Greeks can read it because, you know, they would not have turned on the Egyptians. They wouldn't have set them up and turned on them if they couldn't read the glyphs, if it just it don't make no sense. We know, again, Talis, we know uh, Pythagoras, Plato, we know they studied in Kemet. I mean, look at all of the things that the Greeks and Romans was able to build, you know, after conquest of Kemet. I mean, all of the structures, you know, before Kemet fell, they didn't have none of these uh, cities and everything like that. They didn't have the kind of architecture that they are known for when uh, Egypt was in its heyday. We didn't see this kind of stuff until conquest. So, of course, you know, Tales, Herodotus, Pythagoras, you know, all these people who talk about, you know, Greek and talk about Kemet, you know, they went there, they studied. The, the knowledge and mathematics that they have is unbelievable. And they give openly the credit to Kemet and going there to study. So they would not have left, as I said before, all that gold, all the jewels, you know, just the, the, uh, you know, the priceless artifacts that, you know, they found later on in Kemet. They wouldn't have left all that stuff there if they didn't leave for something far more valuable that would basically have them set you know, forever. And, you know, they left with the knowledge and information that they used to build the empire that we still see in power today. So they had to, of course, uh, decipher all this stuff and understand what was at a stone. I mean, understand the, um, the language and everything like that. They had to. So, um, we know what happened after they got the information, after they basically didn't need Kim no more. They, they decreed that, you know, the temples was, uh, devil worship and it was demon worship. Anybody who go in there and start studying any of the uh, the comedic writings or what have you, it was considered to be uh, demonic text or the de de demonic text or uh, devil worship. And you know, the Pope closed the temples down and basically they left Kemet to be buried, you know, in the sand. So now I understand when they did find the um, Rosetta Stone, of course, the powers that be knew what it was, they knew how to translate it. They know how to read the demonic. They knew how to read the uh, hieroglyphics. Now, if Champollion really wanted to decipher the Egyptian hieroglyphics, where should he have gone? He should have went straight to Nubia, to the Sudan. We know there they got the Meroitic script. And the Meroitic script was basically created from the Egyptian hieroglyphics. It was created between 750 and 300 BCE. Now, it's basically, this is during the, uh, the Napatan period. And Napatan is basically when Napatan was one of the capitals of Kush. So the Napatan is talked about by a lot of uh, Greek scholars. The, the Adorus talks about it, Herodotus talks about it. So they knew all about it. So when it was basically using the writings from Herodotus, because when you start getting into what Champollion used to do this deciphering it, as I said before, they went to some of the writings of Herodotus and Diodorus and a lot of the Greek scholars and, uh, you know, Plato and stuff like that to really try to get an understanding of, of the Egyptian text and what have you. So he should have went to Nubia because even then they knew about the Meroitic script. They knew all about it. And when you look here, we can see that they got the Meroitic demotic script. They have the Meroitic uh, hieroglyphics. This is not something that is uh, new on the scene. They understood that a lot of the people uh, fled from Kemet down into lower Africa 
you know, where all the war was going on. So they knew about these scripts. They knew it was a possibility that either the entire Egyptian language survived somewhere else or it at least evolved into different languages. Now, again, as I said, the powers that be can already decipher the hieroglyphics. They already knew how to read mental lecture. Anybody who came along after that used uh, African languages to decipher the mental lecture. And this is what Champollion used. If Champollion wasn't an agent that was put in place to do this whole, you know, press tidbit about the Rosetta Stone to just basically um, make them look smarter than what they, what they are, then he used African text to decipher the uh, metal netter, the uh, Rosetta Stone, or what have you, because um, there's no way he could have just got the whole translation uh, of all of the um, the symbols and the Egyptian hieroglyphics using simply Coptic, which they try to lead you to believe. The problem is, of course, they don't want to give Kemet or give the African uh, languages credit. Now, as I said, of course, the powers that be could read the Egyptian hieroglyphics. Anybody that tried to do a translation of the Egyptian hieroglyphics had to use African text, African writing to do the translation. There's no way Champollion could have got this whole entire translation done by simply using Coptic. And that's the issue. They don't want to give the credit to the African languages because what you will find out is Every single language that was used or derived from uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics or a hieroglyphic style of writing was eventually replaced by Coptic. And this is why you see with uh, the uh, same thing with the um, with the Meroitic uh, script, it was replaced by Coptic. And this is why what we see with Demotic, you have Coptic and why you can use Coptic to basically go back and decipher Demotic because they took a little bit, a little piece of every language that they changed and kind of sort of put it into that group or that civilization style of Coptic. So you'll have a bunch of different civilizations that have Coptic, but depending on the language that it derived from or they took it from, some of the uh, phonetic or phonemes or some of the little things about the, um, the dialect will be changed to fit that specific civilization. And this is what we find. So it's a lot of civilizations in Africa that basically had hieroglyphic styles of writing. So we look at, um, we have Liberia, uh, Cameroon, Nigeria, uh, you know, so many other places, Somalia as well, that basically had a hieroglyphic style of writing. And we see that most of these was basically, um, changed or, you know, um, taken over and replaced with, uh, Coptic. So now you got to ask yourself a question. Basically, what happened to the ancient Egyptians? And everybody always say that. Well, what happened to them? Where did they go? A lot of them did end up staying in Kemet. And uh, we don't know how many, if you go to Kemet, you're going to see African people there. You don't know if they are uh, natives of, um, of Kemet, that they evolved there and stayed there, which I doubt. Uh, but a lot of the people fled into lower Africa. We know they went into Nigeria. They went to the Gala people who they had a strong relationship with, or the, uh, the Igala people. We know they went into Benin. They went into the Sudan. They went to a lot of different places in Lower Africa where we still find uh, remnants and artifacts of the ancient Egyptians. And they took the language with them and the language evolved. Now, uh, Chapoleon or whoever did the decipherment of the metal letter that we have that we look to today and read, whoever it is had to use African language to do the decipherment, period. There's no way around that. Or Champollion had to use it as well. Or, you know, he is a fraud and probably was basically put there as a puppet to basically, you know, kind of stir people away from the true um, decipherment or the um, real uh, explanation of how they figured out the was of the stone or figured out the decipherment of the metal letter. So he had to either be in on a whole big scam or use the African language and didn't want to basically report on it and tell where it came from to make itself look, you know, smarter. There's no way in the world, as I said, that they deciphered it all using Coptic. It's just not possible, you know, when you understand how this stuff works, that Coptic would basically uh, account for the decipherment of the entire language. And this is what it seems like they're trying to project on people that, you know, the Christian Coptic can basically, you know, reveal the text to the people. So, 
when you start getting into it, we know they had to get certain dialects and tones and stuff uh, from uh, Africa, from these tribes, because we still find it to this day when you start pronouncing some of the Egyptian words and how it sounds. If you go and then find it in an African civilization, what does that tell you? Now, to me, when I'm researching this stuff and when I hear people talking about the hieroglyphics, like I said, I can understand how people are skeptical about natural nature and, um, you know, everything that involves it, involves the language as far as it pertains to um, uh, Europeans. I, I understand how people are skeptical about it, how they can't really go along with what they are reading, because there are not a lot of uh, books out there that a lot of people know about that's really getting into uh, natural nature and um the history of it, because when something makes sense and it fits, you basically leave it alone. But it never dawned on a lot of people to basically question the decipherment of it because, you know, it fits, it works. And um, this is something that um, I'm probably going to end up writing a book on, probably my third or fourth book. Uh, I'll probably get into this because there's so much more information than uh, what's in here that will basically help a lot of people out down the line. Maybe books out that I don't know about that really go into what I'm going into here. But um, from our research, as I said, when you really get into something and you research stuff, it's, I mean, you know what people are talking about. You know where they could have ran into a problem or an issue involving a subject because you came across the same thing in your research, which is why, as I always say, you don't stop at one source. You go to different sources and you try to figure out um, if the last source was true or try to validate what the last source was talking about. 